Hello and welcome to The CEO Show. My name is Simon French and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Tim Carroll, Chief Executive Officer of Focusrite. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much. Now, there are going to be some people who are watching this who don't know about Focusrite. So in your own words, can you mm -hmm. just kick off by giving a description of what the business does and what yeah. it's trying to achieve? Sure. Focusrite is a technology company that serves the audio market. Uh, so we started off back in uh, the late 80s making giant consoles back when it was tape machines and studio uh, consoles back when that's how you recorded audio, whether it was music or if you were doing dialogue for TV or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the company over time uh, saw that that was actually uh, segueing out and technology was becoming really the mainstay in terms of the recording medium mm -hmm. uh, for, for any kind of audio you were doing. And so uh, the company basically started its way into actually taking everything it learned about that big format console and the way you used to record audio and the analog signal chain and starting to bring that into the uh, new formats that people were using. So primarily today, we, uh, we focus on, on technology, hardware and software, uh, strictly for the art of creating audio. And that could be for people who are musicians, both beginners, all the way through professionals. Uh, it could be people that uh, do podcasting. Mm. Um, it's for people who uh, l listen to games or stream games live. On, and also for DJs and electronic musicians as well. And the company has grown uh, hugely in recent years. And yes. You've been there almost three years now, and you've mm -hmm. seen the company become a £350 million market cap company. Yes. Uh, for investors who are saying, look, that's, that's been a stellar journey. Have I missed the boat? <laughs> What, what, what have they got still to come? Yeah, um, I would say no, you haven't missed the boat. Uh, we, uh, we've, we've got a great growth strategy. Uh, we see a lot of opportunity in our core market. We're expanding as well. We mm -hmm. did our first acquisition, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little later. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there, it's interesting. When, when you look at just what our, our core market was to begin with, look, look at um, the, the music market and people that are uh, recording music. There's a really interesting stat um, in our industry. When you take all the people that in any year are buying any kind of music instrument, and that's anything from a ukulele to a saxophone to a keyboard to a whatever it is, yep. and you look at that and you compare it to the number of people that are buying any kind of music technology, fundamentally, over the past five to eight years, that ratio was consistently stayed at 14 to 1. Right. Um, and it's interesting, and you have to ask yourself why when all this technology, the type of products we do, it's amazing the things that you can do. Whether or not you want to be a, aspire to be a professional, if you just want to record yourself for your own practice, for your own personal enjoyment, um, the technology is amazing. So why are more people not taking advantage of that? And uh, we believe fundamentally one of the reasons is, is because as mar marvelous as the technology is, um, it's difficult to use. Yeah. And so our, our mantra, our, our kind of company mission, if you will, is all about removing creative barriers. So on um, the technology, what we, we strive to do is whether you're a beginner and you just want to have some fun with this, you may be a, you know, somebody who plays the guitar and you've got an hour to do this you know, on the weekend when you're not watching your kids or mowing the lawn, or if you're a professional and you get up every day and you make your living on this, it doesn't matter. Fundamentally, you, you need the creative part of this of the, that to be the mainstay. The technology needs to serve you, but stay out of your way. Yeah. And those are the things that we focus all of our attention on and all of our solutions. We continue to kind of up our game on that. And the attention has been on your end of year results in the yes. last week. Mm -hmm. For people who missed those, what are the main highlights? What are the things you draw attention to? Well, the big ones, uh, another year of double digit growth, another mm -hmm. year of double digit EBITDA growth. Yep. Um, we uh, had our first big acquisition, something that we'd been talking about to the investment community for a number of years in terms of our expansion. So we've successfully concluded our first one, mm -hmm. which we're happy about. Uh, we uh, always talk about the fact that, you know, um, the, the, uh, the heart of our company is our R&D. Yes. Um, and we consistently spend 6 to 7% on R&D. In any given year, that yields a cer certain number of products. This past year, 10 new products that have all been, um, you know, embraced by the community, doing incredibly well in the market. Uh, so uh, I guess the other fundamentals are uh, we do a dividend. Uh, yep. We strive every year to increase that. We've done that again this year. I think it's up about 15%. Mm -hmm. um, the acquisition that we did, uh, we paid for in cash. Um, but since we've done that, um, our cash generation has been very positive. Um, so uh, I, would I would just encourage anybody who's not familiar with us, take a look at the annual statement. I think they'll uh, uh, be impressed. And you have within the business three particular brands. Do you, do you have a different pricing strategy amongst those three brands? How do you differentiate between those three different offerings under the same umbrella? Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's no kind of uh, company-wide um, uh, 
policy, if you will. Uh, you know, what I would say is, and I think it's just because of the culture of our company, where we've sort of organically ended up is we are not the, the least expensive option out there. Um, we are considered sort of a premium offering in any one of the categories. And uh, we believe that uh, we, uh, that's justified, A, because of just, you know, the, the legacy, the brand, the product that we bring to market. We're very careful about really structuring and, and contouring the contents of what comes in the box. Mm. So if you're a beginner, the product you get from us has a lot of things in there that are really curtailed for you. Um, if you're a professional, you have a very different experience um, yes. because we think that that um, is what you need, if you will. Um, and then in terms of just what we do is obviously we do look at the market. We look at competitive, what's out there competitively. Um, uh, you know, they, in, in the retail products, you know, there are some rules that they will say that you should never break. Um, one of our uh, company uh, goals is to be bold. And uh, mm -hmm. interesting enough, when the, uh, the, tr the tariffs came into the U.S., um, we, uh, we looked at that and said, well, this is probably, if ever is a time, um, you know, we're not going to, we don't really feel it's the best thing for us or our investors to just take, you know, the profit hit. Let's raise the prices. So this sacred sort of $99 price point that's always been in the market for an interface, we broke that. Right. Um, and, and moved up. And we did it and held our breath, to be quite honest with you. Sure. Um, but uh, it proved out well. And what we saw was that our demand stuck. And investors how, are a little bit obsessed at the moment with the trade war. You mentioned mm -hmm. tariffs. Um, can you just unpack a little bit more, kind of, as a manufacturing hardware, what is the material impact on the ground that you're seeing? How has that affected the business? They're a major pain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, uh, it's, it, it requires a lot of bandwidth to figure uh, out what you're going to do. And it's interesting. I mean, you know, if, if you're a, a glass is half full kind of guy, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, uh, it, it basically pushed us to research a, a lot of things um, that we, you know, we've been dealing with uh, manufacturing in China for many years. Mm -hmm. But when you're suddenly, you know, faced with, um, you know, new tariffs and things that, that uh, can hit your P&L, um, you really start exploring things. So we found some interesting uh, um, aspects of the tariffs. Uh, number one, uh, we were at a scale and a size where we were always thinking, not for because of tariffs at that point, but it was more of just having more of a balanced production yield. We were thinking about maybe we should actually look at another production facility. Okay. And uh, we started talking to one of our big contract manufacturers in China, and it just so happens that they had um, uh, some open space in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at that, and we thought, well, we've got this new product coming out. Maybe this would be a good time for us to spin up down there. Um, that coincided nicely when the tariffs started coming on. Now, that just came to fruition this past September, yep. along with this product launch. But that's one thing we've done to mitigate the, 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 the tariffs. Uh, it was a lot of work behind that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and when you look at it, you go, well, would our time have been better served of looking at other things that just to run the, the normal day-to-day -day business? Of course it would. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're faced with things like that, you know, you have to you have to take a look at that and make the right calls. Now, I want to talk about one of Focus Right's um, product lines, Scarlet. Now, it, it's mm -hmm. rumored to have a market share of anything up to about 50%, which is mm -hmm. must get some quite jealous glances from competitors. What's the competitive landscape ra ra like? How has that changed in recent quarters? Yeah. Well, I mean, we in, in any product category, Category we have we have very specific competition and it's it's you know the the competition is it's it's pretty healthy yeah um, which is good it keeps us on our toes um, so we don't mind that uh, yeah you know that that number gets battered around a lot and that really comes from uh, all the music industry sources which um, you know they're they're okay um, right. to be quite honest with yes. you so there's a, a number of sources we triangulate do some extrapolation and we can see but yeah our, we, we believe um, in that category uh, the scarlet uh, product range is in there um, why um, it kind of I think that the big fundamental differentiator for us is two twofold uh, number of our build quality is second to none mm -hmm. if you pick up one of our products um, and look at it um, people are amazed that we're actually able to actually bring something to market um, that has that kind of construct the second thing is, is it gets back to this whole out of box, easy to use thing. I mean, the one thing you will look if you go and look for Scarlet interfaces is you'll, you'll, you should be pretty amazed if you know anything about Trustpilot NPS scores. We have absolutely state of the art um, ratings on that. Um, and every time we come out with a new generation, we try to up our game on there. So we try to make the out of box experience easier, more streamlined for people. And we've done that again with uh, this one. So those are the type of things we focus on. I mean, we're very, very uh, overjoyed and gratified that the industry, you know, uh, we, we get that kind of uh, um, ratings and that kind of share. 
Um, but I think over and beyond that, you know, we, uh, we see Scarlet's especially that are starting to be adopted into areas like podcasting, yeah. where there really is no market data yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's interesting, we see a number of people that uh, do online gaming and streaming where you know you're you're playing with all your buddies online and you're talking to them but you're having to listen to the audio and mm. there that that needs some connectivity and some technology and on a lot of them they're not sure where to go and they go and they do searches online and they say oh well this this is what all the musicians are using I'll try this and I can tell from this conversation you mentioned already the focus the company has on its R&D mm -hmm. uh, its innovation what products are going to come to market over the next 12 months that you're most excited about? Yeah, well, um, we never really kind of spill the beans on the new stuff, oh, um, to on. be honest with you. <laughs> but well, I, I guess the, the thing I'm real excited about um, is uh, obviously the Scarlets are, are, are still new. There's July, and they're just really getting to the channel. Um, and then on the Novation product line, uh, we just refreshed our launch pad, mm -hmm. which if you're not familiar with that, it's a square with a bunch of lights on it. Right. That's the easiest way to explain it to people. I mean, it's one of those things where if I put it in front of you and asked you to guess what it was, you probably would never guess it was a music instrument. Uh, but it is, yes. because electronic music is has such a different type of foundation than, than uh, the guy that plays the guitar or sings. A lot of electronic music is done by you take little loops and clips and you're combining them in interesting ways with the software. And so have this kind of grid controller to control to actually not only do that when you're recording that, but also to perform live is, is a real big benefit. And uh, that's, a, that's a product that we've um, been working in close um, uh, collaboration with a company called Ableton that make the software. Um, so the hooks to that with the software are really uh, amazing in, in terms of just the integration. Uh, but that's just brand new to the market. Right. And uh, so we're very excited about that one and all, the, all that that brings as well. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about Pro Audio because there's a huge competition at the moment over media content. And sure. it's, you've already mentioned it's potentially one of those stellar growth areas. Well, what's that product going to bring into the marketplace that wasn't there before? Yeah, so um, the Pro Division for Focusrite is uh, primarily it's, it's a set of products that are called RedNet. RedNet basically fundamentally does the same thing our Scarlet interfaces do. It takes audio and it converts it into a digital format. Mm -hmm. What's unique about RedNet and different is once it's in a digital format, you can send huge, vast amounts of channels of that data over long distances over a standard Ethernet cable with absolutely no signal degradation. Yeah. So for people that are mixing films, you know, in a typical film, even for a TV show, when I, when I first got involved in this business, most TV uh, soundtracks were maybe 64 to 128 tracks. They're in the thousands now. Um, so to be able to route that kind of audio around in a, in if you're doing that kind of work, or if you're in, doing live sound and you need to actually move the audio from the stage all the way down to a front of house mixer and they may send it out to an OB van you know, for broadcast, mm -hmm. that requires this um, because you, you, you fundamentally, would, the signal would degrade, degradate yep. um, if you're uh, doing analog. Um, so for all these different workflows, um, broadcasts and just in general is another big one. Uh, the Olympics, the NFL, they yeah. use these products. Um, uh, there's, that's a huge market, and it's just really kind of coming to its own where people are actually looking at, um, okay, I, I've had this infrastructure in place for you know, 10 or 15 years. I need to update it. Um, this is where the industry is going. This solves all the problems I used to have. I'll invest in this. Mm -hmm. And then on the content creation side, especially when you look at you know, what's happening there, look at Netflix, look at all these new content providers. They're building facilities as fast as they can um, to, to handle all the production. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you know, for Netflix, that's a company that looked at all the hardware and said, RedNet, right. that solves our problem. We'll actually put that in our checklist of approved gear. Um, so that, that whole media content thing is definitely driving a big part of the industry as well. And we've talked a lot about hardware thus far, but mm -hmm. I mean, there must be an opportunity in software. How do you see that evolving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for software, for Focusrite, uh, we've traditionally always partnered with uh, folks that, that, that have uh, pretty much just, that's been their mainstay is, is the, uh, the audio workstation and software. Um, We've had, a, um, under our Amplify brand, we've had a number of, of very successful iOS apps that allow you to have kind of a first music experience, if mm. you will. And from that, when I came on board in January 17, I saw what that group had done, and it was an amazingly talented little group. And uh, the problem that I saw um, that was not being addressed that I thought we could, that Focusrite should own, um, was this whole ease of use thing. So the 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 programs that we bundle, um, these mainstays that are state-of-the-art, um, they'll do anything to a piece of audio you would ever want to, 
they're amazing, they're incredible, but mm. they have an amazingly steep learning curve on them. Yep. Um, and we find that for a lot of beginners, they get very frustrated very quick. Um, they want to open the box, they want to you know, pull out their guitar, they want to sing, and they want to make some music in 10 or 15 minutes. Sure. And instead, what they find themselves doing is trying to wade through and navigate through a very complex UI, yep. and they're not really having a lot of fun at the beginning. They can at the end. Um, so what we've done is we've learned a lot from the iOS apps. And so for us, our big software initiative is how do we bridge that gap? Not to compete with the people that are mainstays on there, but how do we actually be that stepping stone mm -hmm. on there? So for people that are just starting, they have a, a really great tool just to have some fun, to start learning the basic, the, you know, the 101 version of, of how, just how, how you record audio. We, if you're a musician or a podcaster or whatever, mm -hmm. here's a very easy set of tools to use so you can kind of have that instant gratification. Boy, I feel really great about buying this. Mm -hmm. Now I want to learn more. So is this an example of data that you've got back from iOS app usage on how the user is engaged and you feeding that back into product development? Is that how you it's see it? It's partly from that and partly the, all the feedback we get from all of our Scarlet users in right. launch packages. It's amazing when, uh, when, we, when we see how many people register as Scarlet, how many people are, are brand new. They've never done this before. And even some of the basic... Uh, technology, um, some of the things that a lot of people just assume people know, like what is an EQ, what is a compressor, how do you plug a microphone into this? Sure. It's, it's, it's baffling, but I, I guess it, it shouldn't be how many people don't really understand any of this. Yeah. You know? So there's so many questions and things that they, they want you to help them solve. Right. And I, and I want to, you mentioned at the outset uh, the exciting acquisition you made of Adam, that, that brand. And mm -hmm. it's going to, I think, generate £12 million pounds worth of revenue this year. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk me through the thinking behind that acquisition? Yeah. What synergies there may be? Sure. Well, uh, when I came on board, it was interesting. Uh, Focusrite didn't really have um, much of an M&A initiative. I mean, huh. you know, the company was successful, so the phone would ring every once in a while. And when I kind of looked holistically, the, the, the interesting thing that I thought was, is, boy, we are such a mainstay um, in people's production thing. We should have the opportunity to participate more in that. Yes. And so we started looking, what are, the, what are the products and the things that kind of fall close to the apple tree, if you will? Sure. Uh, and, you know, one of the things we, we knew from our registration data and just polling and talking to our resellers and our customers, a lot of people that are buying our products are buying a set of studio monitors. I mean, if you're right. recording audio, you need to hear it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, w that was, you know, on the hardware side became one of our um, kind of target areas. And we went out and started looking. I mean, one of, the f one of our first thoughts was, well, maybe we can make these ourselves. We certainly have the contract manufacturing chops to do it. But I think after we looked at the data um, and uh, what we discovered was is the people that are successful in that market have been on the same journey that Focusrite has. In other words, they've spent a number of years, 10 plus years, really developing a brand and a following and a loyalty to that. Um, uh, you know, being intellectually honest with ourselves, could we, could we make a Focusrite brand of monitors? We could, but it would be a very big uphill battle competing sure. with people that are that established. Mm. So it seemed like the better route to that was to actually go out and found somebody that we think was, that had that brand equity, uh, that was very culturally aligned with us, mm -hmm. um, and was well run. Uh, because frankly, we, uh, you know, we're a small company and we're growing fast and we don't have time to clean up a mess. And has that integration, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. and has that integration gone well? It's gone incredibly well. Um, you know, so we had a, with that checklist, um, there was a lot of people we looked at. Adam came, bubbled to the top of the list, if nice. you will. Um, and we've been very, very pleased. Um, you know, uh, we bought them in mid-July. Uh, so for a short part of our calendar year, we had them. They were accretive to the business then. They've done quite well since then, and um, there's been a lot of really great discussions about um, uh, kind of following up on all the hypotheses we had about how we can we upskill this business mm -hmm. um, and leverage you know economies of scale both ways. Sure. And those are it's early days, but they're all kind of proving true. And you mentioned that the acquisition was done out of net cash. Now I mm -hmm. notice on current forecast, your net cash is going to double to more than 30 million by in two years' time. So. Does the, do investors take away that you might be acquisitive in the future? What's the board's thinking on that? Yeah, so I, that's the street forecast and, uh, um, for our cash. And uh, I, yeah, I think we've been very open and honest that uh, um, we didn't just plan on doing one acquisition. Uh, but again, we slow, methodical, and making sure that whatever we look at kind of checks all those boxes I, I mentioned too. I don't believe we're not in M&A. Um, right. I think there's plenty of opportunity, both big and small, uh, for us to look at. Um, to expand the business and, uh, and uh, continue to grow it. Now, obviously, 
your own musical background, which I want you just to explain mm. to people who are not familiar. Uh, how has that framed your thinking around how to lead Focus Right? Yeah. Well, I, uh, for many years, I was a, 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 a studio and a touring keyboard player. Mm. And uh, um, I th back then, and I think it's still true today, the keyboard player is the guy that actually typically uh, was expected to and was um, sort of the geek on the technology. And that certainly was for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so the early days, when none of this stuff worked, I was there um, yeah. and, uh, and kind of was, was patient and could see that how it was going to kind of go. And so that's been a big part of my life all through that. I've, I've, um, I've sort of embraced the technology, um, but I've certainly seen both from my own experiences, from other people's, you know, how it, you know, it can be great on one hand, but it can really get in your way on the other. Um, so that's a big part of, you know, how we've kind of built the company and, and our mantra about, you know, removing the creative barriers. Um, technology, you know, it done in the right way, it can really, really improve and, and heighten the, the, the whole creative process, no matter what you're doing. If you're creating music or if you're a guy that is doing uh, post-production, audio, sound effects, dialogue, it can make your craft a lot better. Um, but it can also be your worst enemy. Of course. Um, and, uh, and again, that holds true for not only the beginner but the professional as well. And so I think that's one thing that's always been front of mind for me is because I've been there, I've seen in, in the real world um, how great it is when it works, and I've seen how disastrous and frustrating it is when it doesn't. And so that's a big part of, of our whole DNA, is making sure that we actually make things as simple as we can for our customers. Fantastic, and what a good way to end. Tim Carroll, Chief Executive of Focus Drive, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to welcoming you again on the next Meet the CEO show.